I want you to imagine we're astronauts. Okay. And we've both got in our spacecraft and we've landed on an alien planet from Earth. We both get out of our spacecraft and I say to you, what is your mission when we're not traveling the cosmos? Interesting. I help people realize how they are addicted to the circumstances in their life they, they think are just happenstance, that are just regular, and that they can break free of that addiction and create whatever life they want. So you challenge our conventional understanding of reality and success and personal transformation yes. um, as a reality interventionist. And I, I don't want to say claim, but I have to say it because of issues that people have where you state the affirmative, but you claim to discover the key to unlocking human potential and overcoming seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Yes. I understand that your journey began with a personal breakthrough, you had an overnight cure for what was long-standing arthritis. It's something through what you call reality addiction removal. And this experience, from what I can glean, has led you to develop this unique philosophy and methodology that you now share with clients in the world. And you argue many of us are unknowingly addicted to yes. our current circumstances, even when they're unfavorable. Yes. Like you, I believe hard work, sacrifice, responsibility, maybe that's what can hold us back sometimes from achieving the true success and happiness, because we have these common beliefs that we've got to do more. We've got to be delusionally busy as yes. distinct from being effectively busy. And that translates as hard work and sacrifice and responsibility. All of those things are key through your energetic magic process. You have programs, is it called monthly magic? Yes where you help people rewrite their realities, leading to improvements in wealth and health and relationships and overall satisfaction in often a matter of days or weeks. I'd love to explore with you a lot more about the concept of reality addiction and look okay. at what the possibilities and limitations are of this approach. So I want to okay. welcome you first to the show, Shiraz, to the Transcendent Minds podcast. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Let's start off with the fact that you overcame arthritis. Was it overnight by addressing what you call reality addiction? Yeah, overnight. So this dramatic personal experience seems to have shaped your entire philosophy and approach to helping others. Can you walk us through the moment or the rising realization where you saw that your arthritis was linked to a reality addiction? Yeah, it's more of a moment because there was no rising reality <laughs> or awareness of it at all. I was working with a mentor and he was going through my life. He was asking me questions about my life for weeks. And what did I do growing up? What was this like? And then finally, he said, well, here's the problem. You believe you're responsible for everyone in your life. And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> That's ridiculous. And he said, no, I know you don't consciously think that. But from everything you've told me, all the stories you've told me, you've created a belief that you need to be responsible for everyone in your life. I know I'm a responsible guy. I was always the designated driver. I made sure my friends got home when we all go out. And I said, but I don't think I'm responsible for everyone. And even if I was, what's that got to do with arthritis? There's no connection there. And he said, oh, no, no, no. See, you don't want to be responsible for everyone. That's too much work. I went, yeah. He said, and if you're lying in bed in pain, you don't have to be responsible for anyone and you don't have to feel guilty about it. If people see you struggling to get through your days, they're not going to ask you to take care of them. The arthritis isn't your problem. It's your solution. What was that epiphany like? <laughs> like <laughs> I could logically see what he was talking about, but it still seemed kind of ridiculous that I would put myself through 18 years of torture just so I didn't have to feel like I was responsible for everyone. When I looked into it deeper, it wasn't actually the responsibility. It was the guilt I felt whenever I couldn't help anyone. And now if I'm lying in bed in pain, I don't have to feel guilty because there's no way I can help them. I'm in too much pain. That also led me to see like patterns in my life when everything was going great for people, my arthritis went into remission. When people started to have problems, my arthritis came back full strength because right? I needed that excuse. So I said to him, you know, okay, if what you're saying is true, then all I have to do is stop being responsible for people and the arthritis should just go away. And he said, yeah. 
if you actually believe it deep down that you don't need to be responsible for anyone, you don't need the arthritis anymore. So I said, okay, I'm not going to be responsible for anyone but me. And I woke up the next morning and there was no pain. There was no inflammation. I had more mobility. I'm freaking out. <laughs> like, what the hell just happened? Because I've tried medication, diet, supplements, acupuncture, yoga, meditation. Nothing worked because that was all just trying to combat the symptoms and not the reason for the illness. So rather than you being an effect, you started to be a cause. I've seen many instances of overnight success that people have when they start to untie the ball of string with knots in it. They, un they unravel one knot, but then they find another knot, then they try something else. And they keep going with this ball of string with knots in it, and they never get to a solution until they disassociate themselves and start to fully mm. understand the, the very fact you, you needed to be responsible for everyone. It's easier to stay with the discomfort of the pain rather than facing the realities or the actual truth so that you can alleviate that pain. Yes. I have to ask you this question, and I don't want to be disrespectful to you, but for people who may be listening to this thinking, yeah, come on, overnight success, how would you respond to skeptics who might doubt the possibility of curing a physical condition like arthritis through mindset changes alone? I have helped many people cure a physical illness, and that's not even my job. Some people call me a healer. I'm not a healer, and I don't want to go around curing people of illness. That's not where my joy lies. However, my joy comes in helping people achieve massive success. And the illness is often a way to avoid massive success for people. So sometimes the byproduct of getting you to that success is curing the illness. For instance, one of my clients, chronic migraines since she was a kid. And she's like, I'm trying to get further in business, but I have to keep taking breaks because of these migraines and lie down for a while. And I'm not nearly as productive as I need to be. Turns out when she was a kid, her dad instilled in her, if you're not busy, you're lazy. So if she just wanted to take a break just to relax, now her dad's in her head going, you're just being lazy. However, if she's got a migraine, she has to take a break. We let that go and the migraines went away. And then her productivity went up, even though she was now taking more breaks because now she's rested and productive rather than stressed out and then trying to work. This relates to so much of the work done by Bruce Lipton and mm -hmm. Dr. Joe Dispenza, where people are having successes within several days and curing these illnesses. Their stories we tell ourselves that have been indelibly engraved into our consciousness from a very young age. That becomes our perception, which becomes our story, which becomes the conclusion. We, we tell it like it's real. At that point, it is real for that person in their life, but actually it's an illusion. Yeah. It's a complete illusion. And it's interesting the, the stories people talk about in that if something goes wrong, let's say your car completely breaks down, it's going to cost $5,000 to repair it. And you're only making $50,000 a year. And you're like, it's going to take months for me to recover from this expense. Now, we always believe that a horrible thing can come in an instant, but then it can't go away in an instant. It's got to take all this time for us to recover from that. But if something bad can happen in an instant, something good can happen in an instant. And people don't tend to see both sides of the coin. The other thing is, what I'm talking about is not specifically illness. It's any consistent issue that's showing up in your life. It's how much money you're making. It's what your relationships are like. If you can't get past a certain point, if there's that barrier and it's consistent, it's because you want it there. It's not because it's hard. And that's what people really need to get. Because when you ask, why do I want this? Rather than what do I have to do to get past it? Then the true reasons start showing up. The whole concept of being addicted to one's current circumstances, whether mm -hmm. it's wealth or health or relationships, even if they're undesirable, is a central tenet of your work. And th there's a suggestion that people unconsciously sabotage their own success mm -hmm. due to these addictions. How would you differentiate? between a reality addiction and common psychological phenomena like self-sabotage or imposter syndrome? With the reality addiction, let's go, money is a big thing for everyone, right? So, so let's say you're not making the amount of money you, you want to make. Now, 
that starts with the belief, but then it gets locked in with an addiction. So for instance, let's say that you are taught you have to work hard to succeed, right? One of the things you mentioned earlier. And so you're working hard and you're making a certain amount of money, but you've been taught you have to work hard to succeed. And thereby, if you want to succeed more, you're going to have to work harder. Now, your mind is like, I don't want to work harder. So we're, we're going to stop right here. Then you see someone having bigger success and they're exhausted and they're complaining about it. Right? So now what happens is you're like, I'm glad I'm not there. I don't like where I am, but I'm glad I'm not like him. And you get a hit of dopamine. And now you're creating this dopamine addiction. Then let's say your friends want to go out and do something that you don't want to do. And you don't want to just say, no, I don't want to do that. You feel bad about it. You, you think that they're, they're going to be upset or, or not invite you out again after that because you said no. So you say, oh my God, you know, I'd love to, but I can't afford it. And they're like, oh man, if you can't afford it, that's fine. So now your brain says, hey, let's keep that in our back pocket so that we don't have to feel guilty for saying no, because we don't have a lot of money. And that's kind of true. So now you lock that in. And every time you say, well, you know, I can't afford it. Your mind's like, see, we get to use it again. That's another dopamine addiction. Then a rich person screws over a bunch of poor people and you hate that. You go, oh, I'm glad I'm not like them. And your mind says, well, okay, if we, if we stay where we are financially, they will never be like them. And then we can watch them do that and go, I'm glad I'm not like him and get another dopamine addiction. And you keep doing it for reason after reason. And it just builds up. So now you don't want to leave this because if you get to that place where you have more money, all those little points of addiction have to go away. Now, your mind doesn't think, okay, let's just trade them up for something better. It's just like, this works. I'm using it. Don't let it go. And it can get even more insidious. So let's say you have a really rough month and you don't know if you're going to pay all your bills and you just pay the bills at the end of the month. Now, as you pay those bills, you're like, ooh, you not only get the dopamine, you get some adrenaline because of the rush that was going on. You get some oxytocin because you feel so great. You did it. And now your whole body goes, wow, that felt amazing. Let's do it again. Now, how's it supposed to do it again? We have to go through another rough month and pay the bills at the end. So now you're in this cycle and you hate it consciously, but the body is all that matters because it's all about the emotional addiction, the chemical addiction in your body. And most people don't get this, that this is a physical thing. It's not just a mental thing. Then you have to look at it like it is an addiction. What happens for people on drug addictions? Eventually their high isn't enough. So now that fix you're getting isn't enough. So now your mind says, what else can we throw in the mix to make this worse? Do we have a worse month we have to get through? Or do we have family problems? What else can we do to make it harder to get to the end so we get a bigger fix? This is the cycle a lot of people get stuck in and they don't realize that they want to get out of it, but they're trying to fix the wrong thing. There are many societal invisible chains in our modern world. I think about the cities we live in, the bustling streets, the quiet corners of our homes where addiction lurks in many forms and it's often unrecognized and misunderstood. While the word addiction evoke images of substance abuse, its tendrils reach far beyond drugs and alcohol because it, it, it ensnares people in a web of compulsive behaviors that offer this fleeting pleasure, but long-term pain. Absolutely. You yeah. can see this with people checking their phones hundreds of times. And if they're separated from it, then they build anxiety. There are people who have the online shopping habit that spiraled out of control. There are people who live in apartments that are cluttered with unopened packages because they're chasing the next new purchase in a new cafe somewhere. There's somebody sitting there with their sugary latte of the day. No, it's going to disrupt their sleep, but they're unable to resist the comforting ritual. These scenarios illustrate the diverse faces of addiction in mm. our modern world, whether it's substances or behaviors or habits. What unites these experiences is exactly what you've alluded to, is their root in the brain's reward system and the powerful neurotransmitter dopamine. At its core, addiction hijacks the brain's natural reward circuitry. That system has been evolutionarily designed to reinforce beneficial behaviors like eating and socializing. But when we're overwhelmed by the intense stimulation provided by these addictive substances and behaviors, the key player is dopamine, which is, I think it's called the feel-good neurotransmitter. Yes, exactly. 
and over time that repeated exposure to those intense dopamine surges lead to changes in the brain that's mm -hmm. something you've alluded to that people do not recognize that they haven't got the awareness of it i remember years ago i watched with fascination the apple stores in regent street in london where people would line up all night mm -hmm. to get the latest ipad or the latest macbook or whatever it was the images in the morning online were people coming out of their store with their new purchase with this dopamine <laughs> expression yes and you think wow that's powerful engineering and marketing mm -hmm. because there's a huge distinction between facilitation and manipulation and yeah. marketing is manipulation yeah, because a good marketing campaign doesn't sell a product. It sells an experience and an emotion. One of my favorites is juicy fruit gum. And you're watching like this person with the gum and they're going out and they're hanging out with people and they're dancing and they're having these adventures. And I'm like, it's gum. <laughs> mm. I just happened to get a visitor here. A bit of a cat drama going on there. Do you have a concrete example of how a client's reality addiction manifested in their life and how your intervention changed their circumstances. Sure. One of my clients, she was actually doing quite well already. We were looking at her business and the addiction was, I need to be needed, right? So she had all these events going on and she had to be at, at the event. So she was running around the country, going to event, making sure everything's great and everything. And when we addressed that and said, well, what if you're not needed? And she's like, what point is there in being my company? I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm not saying you're not wanted. I'm saying, what if you're not needed? And so if your team could just hang and do, do stuff without you, and if you show up, it's a surprise and a delight, what kind of an experience would that be like? And so we tried that with her not going to events. And sometimes she'd go and she'd show up. And so the fix that she used to get, which wasn't really visible, it was all internal, I need to be here because I know I'm needed and I feel needed. So she was getting that internal hit when she was there. It now got replaced with when I show up, everyone gets excited because showing up used to be normal. There was no reaction. She'd just be there. Now she's spending less time letting her team do it. Her team actually stepped up in a bigger way. And in the, the three months that I was working with her, she made as much as the nine months before that by working fewer hours and having more fun. Now she's getting addicted to that thing of just having fun, especially like I'm spending more time with my family and I can do things and not worry. And now she's getting addicted to success scenarios rather than need scenarios. Mm. The thing is, that's the one thing most people get is it's not about getting out of addiction because your body wants to be addicted to something. It's about choosing a better addiction. Right. And so when you get addicted to things that create success and freedom and love in your life, then the same way that you get to say numb, but you used to those fixes were for struggle, your body's like, well, how can we have even more fun? How can we create more freedom? How can we create bigger success? And that's where you see these serial entrepreneurs that I could have retired decades ago, but they keep creating new companies and new things because that's their addiction. Within that addiction, they still have all this free time. They have all this fun and it's just a great life. So what do you want to be addicted to? What, one of the things I, I would love to do delve into with you is about beliefs i'm working on a case for removing belief i see it on the one hand as a source of conflict because when beliefs are rigidly held they've often been the root of conflicts and wars and discrimination throughout history and beliefs can make people resistant to new information or developmental knowledge or scientific advancements which hinder progress and it can lead to uh, confirmation bias where people are seeking out information that confirms their pre-existing notions and they ignore any contradictory evidence so there's mm. a whole limitation of where strong beliefs might limit creative problem solving and openness to different perspectives because those can provide a, a full series of certainty in an inherently uncertain world, which then leads to poor decision-making. I'm looking at as potential replacements for beliefs, something such as evidence-based reasoning. 
In terms of the work that you do, because you challenge many commonly held beliefs about success, hard work and responsibility, and you argue that those beliefs can actually limit one's potential for happiness and achievement. But many successful people attribute their accomplishments to hard work and sacrifice. How do you reconcile your philosophy with their experiences? You can absolutely achieve success through hard work and sacrifice. You don't have to. That's the big difference. You can achieve success incredibly easily, right? You know those, those squeegees they have for the bathroom mirrors? Like one guy just looked at a car one day with a squeegee and it's like, hey, what if I made a little one for the bathroom mirror? That was the whole idea. And it was millions and millions of dollars, right? So it's not like it would have to take a lot of hard work. It would just be getting the patent and getting someone to build it. And he's done, right? So it all depends what your belief is. Now, for me, I am willing to put in a lot of hard work to create success. I'm willing to sacrifice to create success, but I don't have to. And when you're in that place of willingness without it being mandatory, all these other possibilities start to show up for you. Even a small thing like the um, last year, going to an event in Dallas, we have to book the flights, the hotels, take care of all that stuff. And one of my friends calls me up and she goes, oh, I I found this really great deal online. The the hotel will be like 40% off, but I could use a roommate. Are you in? You want to just share the accommodation so we go to this event together? And I'm like, yeah, sure. She goes, okay, I'll take care of all the bookings. I'm like, cool. And she looked at me and she goes, this is what you do, isn't it? Like, like, I did all the work. I call you. You just have to pay and everything's taken care of. I'm like, now you're getting it. (laughs) Exactly. Delegation. Delegation, yes. At the same time, I didn't say I need to delegate this. When you're open to those possibilities, they actually start to show up. Mm -hmm. So the thing you decide you want to do, another thing was with one of my VAs, on my mailing list, I had an idea. It's like on Sundays, let's do a, a weekly intention. Here's the intention for this week. Like do something fun or take some quiet time or tell someone you love them. That's the intention for the week. So I was telling her about this. And I'm like, we'll do 52. Then we'll just rotate them. So after the year, we just run them. And now it's automated. So no one has to do anything. The system will just run them. And she's like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. I said, okay, so we're going to get started on this this week. And so now the next day I'm thinking, okay, 52 of these, what could I get? Then I get an email and she's already done all 52 because she just interpreted it. When I said, we're going to take care of this, I meant I'll do it and you'll put it into the system. But that's not how she took it. And I'm like, oh, well, that was easy. (laughs) Whenever you systemize anything, instead of you being preoccupied, you become free occupied. Yes. Gives you the liberation and the free thinking to be able to engage in being effectively busy and not delusionally busy. Yeah. The, the subtle difference in the action. If I was delusionally busy, I would have written off 52 and then approached her. All right. So you don't realize that you'll take these extra steps to do the extra work. You're just going about what seems normal and logical. The ideas that you have, that I have, that others have who are engaged in this work in different formats, they seem to go against deeply ingrained cultural values. Mm -hmm. How do you help clients overcome the guilt or the anxiety that might arise from rejecting these long-held beliefs? Well, number one is invalidating the beliefs because some of the beliefs are made based on the circumstances. If you're running a farm, right, and there's no one helping you, you have to work hard or you're going to starve. <laughs> That's it. And so that belief, you have to work hard to succeed, gets passed down generation after generation from the time where it was true for that person. If they didn't work hard, they're done. Now we're just repeating things in an environment that's completely different where you don't have to work hard to succeed. So when you start to see the origins of these things, you can start to invalidate them sometimes, often logically. The other thing is how things have changed over the years in that we have these phrases like jack of all trades, master of none, Mm. which there's actually another line that says better than master of one, right? So the actual phrase was don't be good at only one thing. It's better to be good at a lot of things, right? And so that you're more versatile. There's a whole bunch of, of things that we live by that the meanings are the opposite of what we've been taught as they got shortened over the years. 
when you hear the full thing, you, you're like, oh, wait, that's what that meant? Great minds think alike. Second half of that is, but fools rarely differ. So it's not that if you have the same idea as someone else, you're both brilliant. You could be brilliant or you could be idiots, right? But we want to go to free thinking, decide why are you agreeing? That's what that phrase is about, is to do critical thinking, not just think if you agree with someone, it's great. That's why I'm making the case for removing belief, because there are many reasons which I'm not going to go into at the moment. But I think while completely eliminating beliefs is not feasible, and it may mm. not even be desirable, but if we can shift to a much more flexible, evidence-based and critically examined ways of understanding the world, that potentially could address many of the problems associated with puritanical or excessively rigid belief systems. But mm -hmm. this approach would also require significant changes in education, in public discourse, in individual cognitive habits. But the payoff is that it could lead to a much more adaptable, harmonious, and rationally grounded society. That's my take on it. The way I look at it is, if you think about God, God understands everyone. So if you come from that approach, approach to be more godlike, instead of trying to convince people of your beliefs, come to an understanding, not necessarily agreement, but an understanding of the beliefs of others, then navigating the relationships is going to be a lot easier. Because most people aren't trying to come from understanding, they're trying to come from convincing. I've had conversations with people and their philosophy was completely opposed to my philosophy. In those conversations, I get why they think the way they do. I get where the origins of those thoughts come from. And, and I listen and I can agree with their point of view without agreeing with them. When you get to have a conversation with someone like that, they're more willing to listen to your point of view. They may not even agree with your point of view, but they'll listen and they'll be more attentive to it's like, oh, I get what you're saying. Because once a person feels heard, understood, and not judged, they're willing to open up more and share and let their guard down so that you can have an intimate conversation. Most people are the guards constantly up because they're trying to protect their beliefs. If you know that the person you're with is not trying to change your beliefs, but understand your beliefs, then you drop your barriers and have an honest conversation. For me, I'm at home with everybody's belief. I may not necessarily agree with those beliefs, but I'm at home with listening to those beliefs because I come from that godlike perspective where you come out from not an institutionalized perspective, but more from a pragmatic approach because then you can focus on what works in practice as distinct from adhering to ideological positions that emphasize outcomes over intentions. Mm -hmm. So you can adapt strategies based on real world results. And when you have critical thinking, then you can develop those skills in logic, in analysis, in evaluation of arguments, and encourage questioning and skepticism, and promote intellectual humility. So if you're treating ideas as, I, I treat them as working hypotheses, rather than a fixed belief, so that I'm open to revising or discarding hypotheses when contradictory evidence emerges. It's basing the choices on clearly defined values as distinct from just beliefs. That means I've got to regularly reassess and refine my own values and societal values. Yeah, and so, most people aren't willing to go there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You need to have systems thinking. You need emotional intelligence. You need to be able to develop awareness or awakened awareness and know how to regulate your emotions that often underlie those beliefs and cultivate empathy and the understanding for diverse perspectives. There has to be a, a cultural competence in all of this where we can foster understanding and appreciation of diverse cultural practices without needing to believe in their underlying premises. Mm -hmm. So it, it's interesting because you just made me realize something that happened 
for me growing up is I went to one of the most multicultural high schools in my city. So I had a di diverse group of friends. And so when we go to each other's friends, because of the different cultures, the rules would always be different. And because I didn't grow up in a homogenous society where this is just the way things are, my brain was wired at an early age. It's like, depending on where you are, everything could be completely different. <laughs> like it was, And I'm like, now I'm like, oh my God, thank you for that, that childhood. At the time, it seems weird. And then you have to think, now what are the rules here? Because I'm at Joe's house as opposed to Kim's house. <laughs> that was a good training ground. And mm. this is something that needs to be taught in schools. Critical thinking should be taught in schools. Emotional intelligence should be taught in schools. And this, there are courses on that for adults now, so you can just go out and find them. It's something that should be prevalent in our society to make a better society, a more understanding society. I agree. And whilst looking at the case for removing beliefs, and that's quite strong, there are also potential challenges and considerations because for many people, belief systems serve as mental shortcuts. So when you remove them, that can increase cognitive burden. Yeah. And beliefs often provide a, a sense of comfort and meaning. So we need to look at how do we facilitate alternative sources of meaning that we can start to develop and bring about social cohesion because we know that shared beliefs bind communities, as an example. So mm. would there be new forms of social bonding that would need to, to emerge? And then what ethical frameworks would we need? Because many ethical systems are belief-based. So yeah. if, we, if we're developing ethics without beliefs, that would be a significant, I believe, a significant philosophical challenge. Transitioning from a belief-based to a belief-free society would be a monumental shift, which would require generations of change. The thing that I think is missing from pretty much all the, the holy texts is the why. So the, the lesson is there, and this is what you need to be a good person and, and a spiritual person. And everything. If the, the writers included why and, and the background, like this is what's going on, so that we can go back and go, oh, okay, because of this, right? As opposed to, no, just be this way. It says so in this book. That's going to solve a lot of issues for people. And sometimes the, the why is hidden in there and you have to search for it, but different interpretations come out with different whys than the one that was originally intended. So you get screwed up in that space. And I think if we make, and I don't want to like get people triggered and say, if we make a new Bible moving forward of, here's the rules and here's the whys that create a beautiful harmonious society where everyone can succeed, then that's something that can be lasting without being misinterpreted because all that extra information is in there. Now, like I said, a lot of the things, even things we learn in scripture, they get shortened. We have to stop shortening them so we lose the meaning. A lot of those ancient texts mm -hmm. are subject to distortion because yes. we really don't know who wrote them down, when they wrote them down, what mood were they in, what was the environment like at that time, what was the political state at that time, what were the overriding influences at that time. So it, there could be certain distortions in those yeah. ancient texts. Rather than getting it firsthand from source, direct, yeah. in the 21st century, and I agree, Shortening these things is a roadmap to not asking questions at all. It doesn't yeah. give you a pause and a continuance, because even if you look at the symbology of a question mark, it's a hook. Why is a hook to get the next question? It's not just a full stop, because yeah. if we ask questions about the past, they tell us where we've been, and that's fine. Okay, that's where we've been. What about the questions of the future? And the question is of now mm -hmm. and where we're going and what we're becoming and who we're becoming. Those are the questions without dismissing the past, without dismissing anybody's creed or culture or religion or any of those things. It's what are the questions we need to ask in the 21st century that can move the needle forward to cause the elevation and upgrade of the human race? And yeah, and those are powerful questions. The thing I, I think we need for people to start with is to realize that the priority of your mind is to keep you safe. 
So starting the questions from how is it keeping me safe? What beliefs am I putting out there that keep me safe? When you realize safety is just an illusion, you can do everything possible to keep safe and then your house gets hit by lightning. It's when you get out of safety and into awareness, you're in a whole different realm, right? If I'm driving in my car and I'm trying to be safe, I'm looking for possible dangers to keep safe from. If I'm driving from awareness, then I'm just observing what's going on and I'll notice, oh, the way that guy's been driving, he's about to cut across all three lanes. So I'll just slow down a bit. There's never any danger in awareness. There's danger when you're in safety because you have to create it so that you can justify staying in that mode of safety, right? So starting from there and getting to society to a place where society is trying to be aware instead of safe, everything's going to change and the questions they're asking are going to change. Absolutely. That's where you come from a place where you build an inner potency that generates inner stability and outer equilibrium. If you come from that space and you're looking through that lens, then your evaluations and your perceptions are very, very different if you just come from safety. And safety is there for a reason. We all need psychological safety. That's true. But if it makes you run for a, a safety nest, mm -hmm. as distinct from you creating a safety net, then that's problematic because they're always squirreling away and running towards the safety nest which becomes your winning formula, whether it's blame, avoidance, excuses, self-sabotage, all these different aspects, these theater of self-deception that human beings engage in. And not only the theater of self-deception, but the theater of communal deception that the collective engages in. These are big issues and require time and energy to talk about. But I want to move towards your monthly magic program, because I was looking at that and I, I applaud what you're doing because you're promising continuous, I don't want to say the word change because change for me means that you do something more, better or different as distinct from transforming the possibility. Mm -hmm. So I would say that you, the promise is continuous transformation Yes. In various aspects of life, including money and the success and health and relationships. That's ambitious in one sense because it touches on multiple areas of personal development. How do you ensure that the rapid changes that people experience in so many areas of their life don't overwhelm them or lead to unintended consequences? With the program, because we're meeting multiple times each month, it's not just about transformation, it's about check-in, right? So, the, and, and exactly what you're saying, there's been time where we did a session the first Monday of the month, and there was a huge transformation for someone in the program. Then they come back the third Monday of the month and like, I'm freaking out. I'm like, okay, let's find out why you're freaking out. From that first belief that we moved, there were all these other beliefs attached to it that now their mind is like, but what about all this? Right. So then we have to look at those and shift all those beliefs. And the cool thing is in the group, when I'm working on one person, there's all these other people that it's like, oh my God, I got that too. Thank God we're working on this. This is the thing about transformation is one of the reasons I created the program is I've been in other programs to help create more success. And they will have something like once a month or once a quarter, we'll have a mindset weekend where we're going to work on your mindset and get rid of all these limiting beliefs and do some transformation, except that doesn't address the addiction part, right? Because now you you have that transformation, you go into withdrawal and you pull yourself back to where you were, which is why people have that experience. You know, I went to a, a retreat and I came back and I, everything was great for three or four months and then I lost it. Well, you went into withdrawal. You just think that it wasn't as effective as it should be or life came up and took it all away from you. It's like, no, you went into physical withdrawal from your addiction and came up. The point of the program is that Every time you start to go into withdrawal, we get you back out again. And then you start to go into withdrawal and you get back out. And it's not uncommon for people to say, I thought we cleared that. I'm like, we did. And you brought it back. That's life. That's, this is dealing with an addiction. When they really get that, the very cool thing is not within the program, it's within themselves. They start to forgive themselves when they screw up rather than, oh my God, I did it again. It's like, oh shoot, withdrawal. I need to get out of it again. When you start forgiving yourself, you start getting to a place of more loving for yourself. When you start loving yourself more, you start getting better results in general. 
for people listening to this, can you walk us through the typical timeline of the check-ins and transformation that a client might experience in their first month of the program? We meet the first and third Mondays of the month at 1 p.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern for two hours each. And you don't have to come to both. It's because we have people in different time zones, work schedules. So I'm trying to make it as available as possible. In that, you can have, and this is the cool thing about it, as I said, when I'm working on one person, if other people have the same issue, those beliefs get changed for everyone in the group. So you don't even have to say anything. You can just come hang out. And some people do that. There's some people I've never talked to and they've been in the program for years. <laughs> and I've contacted them sometimes. Do you sure you don't want to come? They're like, nope, nope, nope. This is good. This is working. And so we do that. So the first thing we do is celebrate our successes, right? And the thing I tell the group is, if you don't even think you have a success, pick something small. Like I got out of bed this morning. Because once you keep repeating your successes, big or small, your brain starts looking for more and more successes until that's just how you live. We always start off with successes. And then we start going into the breakthroughs. Well, what's coming up for you? I'm not getting enough clients. And I'll ask questions like, do you want clients? One of the things when I work with people is I can tell when your conscious beliefs match your unconscious beliefs, right? And so they'll, and they'll say, do you want clients? And someone might say, yeah. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not coming up true. Then we look at it and it could be a belief like, if I have more clients, I won't be able to spend time with my family. I'm responsible for every client. So the more clients I have, the more responsibility I have. Like, there's all these reasons that show up that you unconsciously don't want clients or don't want money or don't want to get well again. We start addressing all those things and pull them out. Every other week, it's a check-in. As we keep shifting, there's still those check-ins. And sometimes it takes a while. I remember one guy, he said, trust. I was telling a story about transformation. He goes, trust. I've heard you tell that story 50 times now. I just got it. It just sank in. <laughs> like, so you're going to hear similar things over and over again because that repetition causes you to embody it a little bit more and a little bit more until it sinks in and that's who you become. You also use an app called the Positive Intelligence app that trains your brain to think the thoughts you want to think rather than the ones that just decide they want to show up in your mind. So now you can get very intentional about the future you want to create rather than just work your way through it like most of the world is doing. This app has been tested on tens of thousands of people. It helps you become more focused, and calmer in crazy situations, and really set intentions to create success. And that's the thing I found, you need both. You need to pull the crap out and you need to build the mental muscles. One or the other is not, at, they can work, but it's nowhere near as effective as doing both. And that's what we put into the program. Mm. I see that it's like going to the gym. There's a hundred pound barbell there. And it's not that you can't lift it. It's mm -hmm. you're not strong enough yet. You haven't yeah. built the muscle, the mental muscle and the physical muscle to be able to lift it. But it's not yeah. that you can't lift it. Something I, I've also been looking at is how do we look at metrics for transformation or for results? And it, it's a challenging thing to do. How do you measure and verify the success of your interventions across these diverse aspects of a person's life? For the most part, it is during that success part where we're sharing our successes. One of the things I hear commonly with, with the entrepreneurs that are in the group is I'm landing more clients. <laughs> like That's a wonderful metric <laughs> that, that I'm hearing more and more. One thing that, that just popped into mind when you were saying that is in my higher end programs, I encourage people to use what we call the, the wheel of life which is something I may start putting into the monthly magic program. So you pick a few aspects of life, like success, happiness, health, family, and typically people do about eight different things. And people self-evaluate, where am I? I'm a one at success, and I'm a four at family, and I'm a seven at happiness. Then after about six months, you retake the test and see where you are with the wheel. And if the program is functioning as it should, the numbers should be bigger overall in the wheel. It's a full self-reflective tool because you can actually see it you can measure it. You can see when the wheel is not proportional to each of those different things, which is health, wealth, relationships, and so on. If you put those wheels on a car, you're going to have a very bumpy ride in life. I'm not saying it's always going to be totally smooth, but at least you can improve those relationships because they're all interconnected. I really love this conversation with you, and there's so much more that we could go into where can people find you? Where can people find information about your program? And do you have any parting words for the audience? People can find me at energeticmagic.com and everything on the program, all my different programs are there. Passing words is don't be afraid to be the happiest person in the room. <laughs>
right? People sometimes treat happiness like an illness. You're having a lot of fun. They're like, what drugs are you on? What's wrong with you? Right? And, and when you're the happiest person in the room, you give others permission to come up to your level. I was just talking with one of my best friends. We've been friends for like 35 years. And we were talking about when we used to go out to clubs dancing and how we would always get told, make sure you get a cab home. Don't drive home, you're drunk. We were both drinking ginger ale the whole time. Our normal self is as flamboyant and boisterous and crazy as people's drunk selves because we just love being happy. And I would not change this. I laugh every single day, like a big belly laugh will come out at some point every single day. And it just makes life great. Even when things go wrong, I've learned, well, worry doesn't actually help you in any way. right? It, it just adds to the problem because you can still take the same actions from worry as you can from intention and the intention actions will have better results. So I stay in this mode of happiness and gratitude most of my life, and it creates reasons for happiness and gratitude in my life. So that's my advice. Well said. You reminded me of a client many years ago who was telling me that she was so worried about X, Y, and Z. And I said, oh, that's, that's great. So here's a box of Kleenex. I want you to worry all day. I want you to cry all day. Then I'm going to ask you one question. What's changed? Mm -hmm. Nada, nothing. It <laughs> hasn't contributed to anything. Yeah. Oh, but you got to allow me to worry. Yeah, absolutely. Here's the Kleenex. Take all yeah. day. But what's changed? Thank you so much for a great conversation. How have you experienced the conversation? I love this conversation. I do a lot of podcasts. And most of the time when I'm talking about my philosophies and my techniques, people are just absorbed and like, oh, wow, there was a lot more back and forth because you're quite a knowledgeable guy. And I love the input you were coming back. To. We were having a, I felt like a mutual conversation rather than me explaining and people asking questions. So yeah, thank you so much for that. Oh, you're most welcome. It felt like I was sitting down in your office or in your home, having a cup of coffee with you and having a, a dialogue. I love that feeling where there's this mutual co-shaping and co-creation where we can have a dialogue about something and we can have this to and fro, because I think it's a bit sterile otherwise just to say, okay, where's my sheet of questions? Oh, I need a sheet of questions <laughs> yeah. here. I'm going to ask Shiraz about, yeah, sure, I'm going to ask you some questions, but I think the to and fro, it's much more of a natural flow. And when you can go with the flow, you can go. So <laughs> that's important. So thank you, Shiraz. And I'll, I'll let you know when the video onto YouTube and I'll send you some shorts as well. Sounds good. Okay. So much, Peter. This has been great. Have a great day. And thank you so much once again, Shiraz. Shiraz.